and what we'll probably do, especially during the the speakers, is just just keep ourselves on mute, and that way our uh, we won't be. I think you're already there, Chuck. So so before you'd speak, you know, you'd you'd go off. Uh, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Jordan to, to each of you. This is Jordan, my associate with the Heart and Mind community. Of course, you, you know Miss Angie. Uh, this is uh, uh, Mr. Chuck Roth, uh, Dr. Angel Adams Parham as well. Jordan is our facilitator for today. So he'll be um, collating questions, sending them to us, and I'll, during the, the panel discussion, I'll go ahead and share those with you as, as we get those. I think it's time, Jordan. Good morning. I am Todd Amick, um, the chair of Catholic Theology, the Sue Ellen Canizera Chair of Catholic Theology at the University of Holy Cross. I'm also the coordinator for the eradication of systemic poverty. And on behalf of uh, our university, our heart and mind community, as well as our speakers and our panelists today, we welcome you to um, our webinar, Faith, Hope, and Love, A Catholic Response to Urgent Action, A Catholic Response to Healing Action, uh, where we will explore through Catholic identity, which we have articulated as the theological virtues and through three of our speakers, um, uh, we'll explore these theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, see the path that they, they plot forward, and then uh, Dr. Parham, as well as Mr. Roth and I, from our experience in poverty intervention, as well as serving um, uh, the populations that we do, uh, we'll talk about the ways that those, those virtues are essential and operative um, in poverty intervention, as well as, as, as serving the communities that we're, we're called to. Um, uh, we now have a, uh, a welcome from, from Dr. McNeely, the president of the University of Holy Cross. Greetings, my name is Stanton McNeely. I have the honor to serve as president of the University of Holy Cross. And welcome to this Heart and Mind Initiative brought to you by the University of Holy Cross and the spirit of a Catholic university founded by the Marianite sisters it is truly the fulfillment of our mission that brings us together today, especially during these times. I'd like to thank Dr. Todd Amick and our presenters for their work today in the spirit of faith, hope, and love that as a Catholic university, we can come together and be a light for our world now during these times, as well as for healing as we go through in the spirit of Christian charity, the steps ahead for all of us together. Thanks again to our speakers and to Dr. Amick. 
This is an important initiative for us. And also, I'd like to share with you the mission of the University of Holy Cross and our core values, which this Heal Heart and Mind initiative is definitely a manifestation of. The University of Holy Cross, a Catholic institution of higher learning, is an inclusive student-centered learning community focused on academic excellence and innovative teaching. Rooted in the traditions of the Marianites of Holy Cross, the university is committed to educating the minds and hearts of its students through freedom of inquiry, the pursuit of truth, and compassionate care for all. And the university's core values are excellence, respect, integrity, inclusion, and compassion and service. And with that, I just want to say thanks again. God bless you all. God bless this Heart and Mind Initiative, and God bless all of us in this world. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now invite uh, Ms. Angie Ruiz, uh, the campus minister at the University of Holy Cross, uh, to lead us in prayer, as she also unites the prayers of all of the Marianites that are with us today. Thank you, Todd. So let's begin as we begin all things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, your love for us is all-encompassing, and we ask for your healing peace in these challenging times in our world. Open our hearts and our minds today to hear your message of faith, hope, love, and healing. Give us the courage to transform our lives, to be a witness of your love to all we encounter. We pray for healing and unity in our world because we all truly are your children of God. We pray for the end of the coronavirus, for all those who are ill, that you may send your healing touch upon them, for all those who have lost loved ones, that they may have peace knowing that they are truly in the arms of God. We pray for all students, faculty, staff in every school, that they may return safely and that they may have a grace-filled year. We ask all of this in your name, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Angie. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and give you a sense of, of the progression of the day um, so that we can, we can plan. Um, we are going to be alternating three different speakers. Um, first, Deacon Larry Oney um, will come to us via his, his pre-recorded um, um, uh, talk for us. Uh, then we'll have a panel discussion with uh, Dr. Parham, with, with Mr. Roth, with myself, um, as we talk about the, the virtue of faith and how it's essential to the work that we've done, and also then how it, it, it was operative. We can see how it was operative in the life of, of Deacon Oni to lead him to a place of, of fulfillment, to lead him to a place of, of, uh, of peace and of, of reconciliation as well. We'll then take a, a brief break. Um, we will then come back. And our second speaker will be Dr. Mario Sacasa, who will be joining us live. He will talk about the virtue of hope. Um, we'll then have a panel discussion talking about how hope has been instrumental in our work as educators um, and as education facilitators as well. Um, and talk about the intersection of Catholic identity and, and education through that virtue. We'll then take a, another quick break um, we will then uh, uh, reconvene for um, uh, our, our talk on love. Um, and for this, um, uh, Father Josh Johnson of the Diocese of Baton Rouge um, will we'll offer his introduction. We will then see a talk that he offers um, to the Southern Province Jesuits. We will then discuss the virtue of charity, the virtue of love, um, as it relates to the intersection of Catholic identity and education as well. We'll then take a few minutes at the end um, to discuss uh, some next steps, to discuss some ways that you can um, continue this conversation in your churches, in your parishes, in your different schools, in your different communities as well. Um, this, uh, this Healing Action Initiative is, is designed to be a place where a conversation occurs, as I mentioned, at the intersection of Catholic identity as well as the intersection of, of education. Two forces that, that have been uh, catalysts for, for profound change. Um, the theological and the, the, the understanding of God, as well as the anthropological, the understanding of the human person, uh, revealed by God um, in his son, Jesus Christ, and enlivened in us and, and, and supported in us by the power of the Holy Spirit, has consistently been a force for good 
in recognizing human dignity. Education has often been a key way um, that this understanding of who God is and who we are as human persons, and thus our, our opportunities, our privileges and our obligations to, to one another, a way that those could, could be lived out. And so we're going to, um, to explore through these three theological virtues um, uh, some ways forward, but we're also going to be creating resources that you can then bring back to your parishes, your schools, etc., so that as we ask each other, what can we do? Um, the answer can be, well, you can then show these resources, these videos, which will be posted on our website. You can then uh, share best practices so that we can continue this conversation. Uh, uh, we will now um, uh, begin with our, our, um, our talk from Deacon Larry Oney, who will help us to understand the virtue of faith and how it was essential in his life to find a pace of peace and fulfillment, and also how it's going to be important to the work that we do. Hello friends, I'm Deacon Larry Oney, and I'm the president and founder of Hope and Purpose Ministries. I'm a businessman and a deacon in the Archdiocese of New Orleans, Louisiana. Our focus for Hope and Purpose Ministries is threefold. First, we want to expand the kingdom of God. We want to heal the brokenhearted. We want to give people a sense of hope and purpose for their lives. The three scriptures that undergird our ministry are Matthew chapter 10, verse seven, which says, as you go, proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And John chapter 10, verse nine, Jesus says that the thief comes to kill, the seal and destroy. And in John 10, 10, which is a focus for us, it says that but I have come, that is Jesus has come, that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And the final scripture is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 to 14. The people of God had cried out to God. They were in slavery. They said, Lord, have you forgotten about us? They implored God and asked God to hear them. And then God, as he always responds to his people when they cry out to him, he raised up a prophet named Jeremiah. Jeremiah spoke to the people and said, I'm paraphrasing now in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 to 14. I know well the plans I have for you. I plan to bless you, not to curse you. I plan to build you up, not to tear you down. I plan to give you a future full of hope. When you call out to me, Jeremiah says, this is what Jeremiah is saying to the Lord saying, I'll hear you. When you look for me with all of your heart, I'll let you find me and I will change your lot, says the Lord. I'm thankful today for the University of Holy Cross for sponsoring this series, which is uh, called Heart and Mind Healing Action Initiative. We are certainly in a moment where we need healing in our cities and in our nation. And I believe that all institutions of higher learning, particularly those that are Catholic, should be offering series like this so that we can move beyond the racial strife and tension that we have in our nation. I'm pleased today to be sharing with you from my book, Amazing Grace, Overcoming Race, which was updated to be titled uh, Amazed by God's Grace, published by The Word Among Us. In that book, I chronicle my time as a young black man and an adult adolescent, really, uh, seeing for the first time the power of race, which caused me to have a posture of resentment. That initial shock, anger, sadness, and ultimately resentment would shape my life for many years forward. It's only by God's amazing grace that I was able to shake loose the shackles of resentment, racial uh, inequality and anger and move forward toward God's divine destiny for my life. As we all know, we're in the middle of a significant racial strife in our country, and we are in the middle of a worldwide pandemic at the same time. There have been demonstration, protests, and damage to property, and in some cases, injury and even death to individuals in the past several weeks in our nation. Of course, for many, it was the murder of a man named George Floyd in the streets of Minneapolis, Minnesota, that precipitated and showed our nation its as many uh, wounds that have not been healed, that have not been dealt with. We saw the death of George Floyd in living color on our television screens. Today, I'd like to share some of my story about the power of race and how by faith in God's grace, I might add in some small way, hopefully, a path for us to move on as a city, as a nation. I call the movement of faith and grace in my life uh, that I share in the book, the seven moments of God's amazing grace. They are outlined in detail in my book, Amazed by God's Grace, as I said before. Before I share my testimony though, I'd like to briefly share my convictions about where we are as a nation 
and as the church in this moment. Our church, the Roman Catholic Church, has seven key components of our social justice position. We are one of the few faiths that have our social justice position codified. All of what we say in our social justice position rests upon the single platform, that is, that every person has human dignity. It's not given by the state. It's not earned by your ethnicity that we have our human dignity because of God's grace in us. When the human dignity of any person is not of hell, there's instability and brokenness in the community that needs to be revived and renewed. A city or a nation cannot be revived simply by infrastructure improvements and by political leadership. These things are needed, no doubt, but the foundation that must be laid that must be renewed and revived is a spiritual foundation that can only be embraced by faith through grace and that grace can only come by God himself. When a spiritual foundation is laid strong or renewed strong, then everything that is laid upon it is solid. Sometimes when we allow the spiritual formation or foundation to crumble or fall down, we have to begin again to refresh it or to revive it. We're in a moment like that now in our cities and in our nation in regards to race relation. We must begin again. That which has been broken needs to be renewed, revived, refreshed. In 2 Chronicles, uh, Solomon is dedicating the new temple for the Lord. He was making a dramatic offering of an uncommon offering to the Lord. Uh, in chapter six, uh, Solomon had asked the Lord, Lord, if we sin against you, if we are not right with you, will you hear our prayer in this place? And the people were praising God during the dedication. They were singing that the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. They prostrated themselves, meaning that they laid down upon the ground. They put their faces on the ground. And that's what God is calling us to do, I believe, as a city, as a state, and as a nation. He sent the people back to their homes that is Solomon did rejoicing, and they were glad of heart at the good things that the Lord had done. That night, the Lord appeared to Solomon, and he gave Solomon an answer to his prayer. Solomon had asked, Lord, would you hear our prayer in this place? And the Lord said to Solomon, uh, Lord, uh, uh, Solomon, if I close up heaven so there's no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence among my people, and this is what he said, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the evil ways, God says he will do this. He says, I will hear you from heaven, I will pardon your sin, and I will heal the land. We're in a moment like that now. We need God to hear us from heaven, to pardon our sin and to heal our land. This prayer, you know, does not depend upon what the world does. God says that if my people will call on my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. He says, I will hear from heaven because this God of ours can move the mountains. He can keep us in the valley and he can hide us from the rain and he can heal our nation. It's said that there are seven mountains of influence in the world, art, entertainment, business, media, education, family, and religion. It's also said that whoever controls these mountains of influence controls the world. I propose today that there's another mountain that no man can control, and that is, is the mountain of God's amazing grace. God's amazing grace has the power to transform a life and I'm here today to give testimony to the seven outpourings of God's amazing grace, I'll call them, that transform my life. My testimony uh, in terms of the seven moments of grace, uh, I like seven for seven is a good number. Uh, there, seven means fullness, wholeness, completion. There are seven notes on the musical scale. There are seven mountains of influence, as we said earlier. The Sabbath occurs every seven days. I'm the seventh child of 11 children. When I was seven years old, I had to go to the fields. The Israelites marched around the walls of Jericho for six days and on the seventh day, they shouted and they got the victory. Now I wanna share my testimony with you, these seven points about my uh, movement from resentment and hatred to a place of faith and a receptivity to the grace and mercy of God. I was born in North Louisiana, the seventh child of 11 children, eight boys and three girls. When you were seven, as I said, you went to the fields and in the fields, uh, that was a difficult time for a young person uh, to be. We didn't have a lot to eat as we were growing up. We always laugh, even my family right now, when people say you have to make the children eat 
uh, the leftovers or eat their greens. We had a lot of greens and there were no leftovers. If you didn't show up for your meal, uh, you didn't have anything to eat. I was born on a place called Weiwei Plantation uh, in what we call now Egypt. It was our place, not of slavery, but it certainly was our place that we felt like we couldn't extricate ourselves from. I remember my mom and the other women in the field singing this song about I fly away. I didn't understand it as a young man why they were singing, but I understood as I grew older that the work was hard, the circumstances were difficult, and they were looking for another time. That's why they were singing about I fly away where there'd be no more sweat and toil. I want to be clear with you that it was a difficult time where I grew up, uh, but we were poor, but we didn't really know as children that we were poor. When we went to the fields, they would spray the chemicals for the soybeans right over our heads onto the fields. We would swim in a runoff ditch where chemicals from the, the fields would be mixed with the water. And as a result, we had many rashes and other ailments that some of us still suffer with today. I know when I was growing up, after we moved to the city, we had more toys than we ever had before. We didn't have many toys in the country. We used some of the tops from the chemical cans, uh, as we call them, spinning tops, a piece of uh, a spinning top on a piece of wood, a uh, top from a chemical plant on a piece of wood. That was our toys that we had. It was a difficult time, but we were together as a family. Uh, when I was about seven years old, I had my first occasion to see the power of race at work when I saw the majority landowner come to my father. I was just a kid and I was looking out the window and I could hear out the window and I heard the landowner say to my dad, don't let B, B was my mom, uh, take these boys away from here. See, we were eight boys, even though you were young, we were a source of labor, a significant labor force and the landowner didn't want us to leave the plantation. But my mom, despite the warning of the landowner, she had another idea in our mind. She wanted us to go where we could have a good education and have other opportunities. So we went to a place called Kenner, Louisiana, the promised land for us. Only one problem getting to Kenner, we had to pass through Mississippi. Even as a 10 year old kid, I knew about the Ku Klux Klan. So my uncle who came to drive us told us to keep our heads down as we road to Mississippi. There was a lot of fear and tension in my heart during that trip to Mississippi. And I know even today, Mississippi has a legacy of a place of fear for many people of color that have to live there and some who have to even drive through there now. So I got to the promised land. And of course, it's not always promising in the promised land. There still was a lack of uh, work uh, and there were problems there as well. I tried to join the Black Panther Party uh, when I was around 15, 16 years old. Uh, I really wanted to join the Seminese Liberation Army, but they weren't present in New Orleans. There was much more, they were more radical than the Black Panther Party, but I couldn't raise the 20 cents to go down to catch the bus to see if I could find the group to join them. When I was in high school, I went to work in an area that was affluent down Metairie Road. Some of my listeners here will recognize uh, Metairie Road. We had a lot of uh, bottles and uh, eggs and rocks thrown at us at us by some of the young white guys driving their trucks down Metairie Road. I was growing up to be uh, very angry at that time. And then something happened in my life. It was something that was at the beginning of God's amazing grace in my life. A majority woman came to our house and offered some food to us on Thanksgiving day. We didn't have anything to eat except some greens that day. We didn't quite know what to do and I didn't quite know what to do, uh, how to uh, uh, think about what she had done. She had changed my whole perception of majority people because majority people didn't come to my neighborhood. I believe that I was experiencing God's grace and mercy. As I look back on that, I was developing a real hatred, but this woman changed my whole life uh, the trajectory changed by her coming and offering food on that day. So we recall this woman, whoever she was in our family. Now she wasn't from the welfare department. She wasn't from the police department. She was just an angel of mercy who came to bring food to a family, to someone she knew was in need. Now I couldn't reconcile that in my mind. Why would this white woman bring food to our dangerous neighborhood? But she did. That was the first moment of grace. And I was trying to say, well, uh, I couldn't say anymore that no majority person had ever done anything good to me, uh, for me and my family. 
I want to look at the grace moment number two in my life, the movement of grace in my life. God's amazing grace was rushing in now. I didn't know it then, but I can see it now. That was just the beginning. Not too many months later, I was crossing the Mississippi River with my brothers as a young man on a ferry boat. It was interesting that the Spanish, the uh, Spanish people of old called the Mississippi River the river of the Holy Spirit. And the Jesuits would later, later on call it uh, the river of the Immaculate Conception. Well, the Holy Spirit was certainly at work during this time. I was with three or four of my brothers, I can't remember precisely, and we were going fishing down toward the Gulf of Mexico. This young man walked up to me and out of all my brothers and said something I'd never heard in my life. He said, God has been looking for you. And I realized that for this young man, the boat was his pulpit. He was riding back and forth on the ferry boat and whoever he would see prompted by the Holy Spirit, he would approach them, witnessing to them, evangelizing them. And that day he shook my soul. So this was the, now the second movement of grace in my life. Somebody witnessed to me. This is why we as a Catholic people, all of us must participate in evangelization. It's not gonna be in church. It's not always in a convenient place. Sometimes it's on a ferry boat. Now the third movement of grace in my life. I don't know how this happened, but I was asked to go on a retreat. I didn't wanna go. I told the person asking me that I'm gonna be sick on that day. I didn't wanna go. Uh, I didn't even believe in anything Catholic because I said the Catholics are a little bit odd. They kneel down a lot. They eat flesh, they drink blood. That's what they say in all of their, their literature. Nevertheless, I went on the retreat and there was a little woman who later on would be my godmother. Her name was Sue Gorman. She came up to me and she said something that I had not heard in my young life. She said that God loves you, Larry. Now you say you've never heard that in your life. No, I never heard that. It struck me to the core. And I did something that was difficult for me as a young man to do publicly. I began to cry. I didn't understand why I was crying. That was God's grace moving in my life. I'm moving to grace moment, uh, grace moment number four now. Uh, as the people were going to communion, as I was observing this, something had been stirring in me. I had begun to read the Bible. I was reading John chapter six, verse 54, which says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood is eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Well, I'd actually believed that scripture. So as a thirst, a thirst for the Eucharist welled up in me, I wanted to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ. Didn't quite know all that it was, but I believed the scripture and now I was leaning toward understanding. God was giving me his grace at that moment for me to observe people going to communion. Now I know that that's the body, blood, soul, divinity of Jesus Christ. I understand more fully, but see, uh, grace doesn't always give all the intellectual underpinnings for us to understand. Grace is not uh, constrained by our uh, intellectual ineptness. It's not constrained by our own pre-thoughts or our own disposition. Grace simply moves where it wills. Grace moment number five in my life. And so God sent a deacon into my life. I love deacons and perhaps that's why I'm a deacon today. This deacon drove 50 miles for two years back and forth to catechize me, to teach me the faith. And ultimately, I moved on to be baptized among the Cajun people where he came from. He baptized me on a Friday night, I believe it was. I was gonna receive the sacrament of the Eucharist and I was gonna be confirmed. It was a powerful time. My brothers were there, my mother was there. And when I went down into the water, indeed, when I came up out of the water, all the indignity that I had suffered, all of the things that I'd gone through, uh, God was washing them away. It, I, I can't describe that moment. All I can tell you that I was a new person. St. Paul says that we are a new creation. We were baptized. I experienced that newness of life. And when I came out of the water, the faces of the people looked like the faces of angels. There was something that had happened in me. Hard to describe. It's experiential, but I can tell you it indeed happened. I, for many people in that church, it was the first time that they'd seen an adult black person baptized in their church. It was a moment for them and it was a moment for me. God had touched me and had transformed me. But then I had to deal with 
the fact that as a young man, I had done a lot of things and I didn't know what I was going to do with this sin in my life. I didn't fully understand uh, confession and forgiveness fully, but I was getting it. Then someone shared a story with me about the Lord's law and his love. It starts out, it's a story about a great African tribe. Uh, they were blessed in every regard. They, they uh, uh, had running water, wild game. They never had a problem. And then suddenly there was stealing among the tribe's people. And the tribe people, the, the chief of the tribe said, when we find the thief, we'll give that thief uh, 10 lashes. And the, still, the stealing continued until finally the chief said, we're gonna give him 50 lashes and 50 lashes would kill most people. And so they found the thief and the thief turned out to be the mother of the chief. And so they brought his mother into the compound and they ripped the clothes from her back and put her in the middle of the compound. And the people couldn't believe it. They said, ah, is he gonna satisfy his law or his love? And so the day for the punishment was here and everybody was watching to see. And the taskmaster came out with a bulging whip in his hand, ready to do the chief bidding. And the chief raised his hand and said, let the punishment begin. And the people said, ah, he's gonna satisfy his law at the expense of his love. And as the taskmaster reared back to deliver the blow, certain to kill the mother of the chief, the chief raised his hand again and said, stop the punishment. And everybody said, ah, he's gonna satisfy his love at the expense of his law. But then the chief took off his robe, walked over his mother, stretched out his arm and covered his mother with his own back. And then he said, let the punishment continue. And in that way, he satisfied his law and his love. And I realized that hearing this story, that's what God had done for me. I was guilty as a sinner. God had covered my guilt with his own blood. And he had loved me as his son. He had satisfied his law and his love. Now the seventh grace moment in my life on December 13, 2008, a lot of things happened in between, but for the sake of our time today, I'll tell you that I had the privilege to be ordained a deacon in the Roman Catholic Church at St. Louis Cathedral in the city of New Orleans. It's significant not only because I was ordained that day, but I had to travel past a place called Congo Square, which many in New Orleans know exactly where it is. That's about a mile away from the place where I was going to be ordained. In the 1800s, Congo Square held over 100,000 slaves, a third of those women and children. So my journey to the cathedral every day is past Congo Square. And in the cathedral, the children of the ancestors of those that enslaved my ancestors are being ministered to by a descendant of slaves. This is a powerful thought for me and a moment for me when it hit me in a city that still has a share of poverty and violence and racism. Something had happened to me. I was tasting God's amazing grace. That story didn't shake me, but I was recalling at that time the story of John Newton. Many of you may know the story of John Newton. It's a true story. John Newton was the captain of a slave ship in the 1700s. He carried slaves from the coast of Africa to England and some of those slaves on to the Americas. One day when he was making a crossing, a great storm came upon the sea and the bowels of his ship were full of black slaves. John Newton was sure that he was going to lose his bounty of slaves and that he may lose his own life and that his ship would be lost. The storm raged and the ship was tossed to and fro and then suddenly there was a calm. John Newton didn't die and later reflecting, John Newton wrote these words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And I too can say like John Newton, I was blind with prejudice and hatred, and I felt I was right in doing so. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. There was only one thing left for me to do, which was to go to my dad that I had a lot of issues with in the past. Now I'm 27 years old. I wanted to know my dad why he hadn't helped us when we were poor and hungry in the city, just like we were in the country. I'm a man now, but I'm now baptized and something has happened to me. The Holy Spirit has come into my heart. God's grace has flooded my being. And so I went to my dad in humility and I asked my dad what happened. My dad made $35 a week. He had, had, a, uh, he had started a new family and he had saved little money orders of $5. 
because uh, he knew that someone was going to be coming. It was 15 years later, and I was coming to say, why didn't you support us, Dad? Life is complicated. My dad and I cried a lot that day. We went something that we did something we had never done before. We went fishing. We caught one little fish, but it didn't matter because I was with my dad. I had rebuilt that relationship with him. We were once again, it was a, it was a new beginning in my life. It was part of God's amazing grace. This was Lanyap. I know when I was a young man, I wanted justice in my life. I was demanding justice. But as I grew old, I realized that mercy is greater than justice. And I'll share this story with you and I'll close. Some of you may have already heard this story. I'm told it's a true story. Justice said to Mercy, uh, let's have a meeting. Let's meet at Jacob's well at three o'clock. And Mercy said, don't worry, Justice, I'll be right on time. Justice got to Jacob's well early. He was walking around Jacob's well and he got stuck in some quicksand. And he cried out, oh, Mercy, where are you? And then the more he fought, the deeper he got. He was up to his chest and then up to his mouth about to go down and on to death. And just as the sun was about to kiss the horizon, Justice cried out one more time, oh mercy. And then as he was going down, Justice felt a hand of mercy on his hand and mercy pulled Justice out of the quicksand. See, sometimes Justice gets stuck. Justice got out, washed himself out and said, oh, mercy, where were you when I called out to you? Mercy said, oh, I heard you calling out and I was on my way to help you. But then I heard my friend Hadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they were in the fiery furnace and oh, Mercy had to go down there and fan the flames so that they could not be harmed by the flames. I'm sorry, I smell like smoke. And I was on my way, Justice, to help you. And then I heard my friend Moses, he was down at the Red Sea with his back up against the wall. And oh, Mercy had to get in the Red Sea and I fanned the waves so there could be a wall of water and the children of Israel could go to on dry, dry land. And I was on my way and then I heard Daniel who was in the lines then. Oh mercy went down quickly, got in the lines then. I closed up the mouth of the line so that Daniel would not be harmed. I'm sorry, my clothes got a little torn. And I was on my way. And then I heard somebody down in New Orleans, in Minneapolis, in Dallas, Texas, in Philadelphia, and they cried out and they said, oh mercy, come over here. And I went there and I put the balm of my peace and my grace in their hearts and on their lives. And then I heard you crying out and I got on the wings of goodness and kindness and I flew quickly and I pulled you out of the quicksand. And Justice said, ah, oh, mercy, I see how it is with you. You may not come when I want you to, but you're always right on time. So as we, continue to have our discussions as a community, as a church, as a nation about race, about racial injustice, about systemic racism and inequality in the way that we live with one another. We ask that God would extend his mercy to us. May we be like the people in Second Chronicles where God says, uh, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their evil ways, God says that I will hear from heaven. I will pardon their sin and I will heal the land. So may I offer this prayer for us. Lord, we pray that you will send your mercy, that you would heal our land, that you would heal the racial division in our country. America is a great nation, but we must reach so that we may fully embrace our full potential and our divine destiny. Lord, we ask that you would send your peace in our discussion, that we be bold and courageous in saying what is true, what is beautiful, what is good about ourselves and about our fellow brothers and sisters. Lord, we need your grace in order to do this. We need your strength. We need the Holy Spirit. So we invoke the Holy Spirit. We invoke the angels, the archangels, the principalities, the powers, the dominion, the virtues, the throne, the cherubim, and the seraphim. And we invoke Mary, the mother of God, to be with your children. And we invoke the name of Yahshua HaMashiach. Lord Jesus, come now, be with us, strengthen us as we go forward so that we might grow 
so that we might be the people you desire us to be, extending ourselves even further. We ask for these blessings and for this help, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, who's Lord forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. And glory to God. All right, excellent. Um, now that we have uh, experienced um, this, uh, I think this profound witness from Deacon Larioni, um, uh, the the panelists um, and Jordan, can can everyone see uh, Dr. Parham and, and Mr. Roth and myself? Okay, um, we will now um, uh, talk about the role of of grace, the role of faith. Um, in the particular work that we do, um, you know, we've sent to you the the bios of uh, Dr. Parm as well as Mr. Roth and and, and myself, um, and so we will. Uh, uh, you've you've gotten a, a chance to be able to get to know them. Um, I'm going to invite each of them to begin uh, by simply talking about the the particular role that they play. Uh, Angel with Neon Sa. And Chuck is the executive director of Boys Hope, Girls Hope of, of Greater New Orleans, um, uh, but about the, the work that they do first in education, uh, and then we'll, we'll have kind of our first question that, that we have about the role of faith um, in the work that we do. So, uh, Angel, I'll invite you to um, uh, talk a little bit about Neon Sa and, and the work that you do. Thank you, Todd. Um, I'm, I'm so blessed to be here with you all, and that very powerful testimony is really still with me. Um, wow, that, that, it was wonderful, and I'm, I'm just so we were all able to share it. Uh, so just a little background on me. Um, so Nyansa Classical Community, which uh, Dr. Amick referred to, it is a, a nonprofit that is focused on bringing Christian classical education programming to low-income African-American students here in New Orleans. Um, I am also a professor of sociology at Loyola University, and it's been my pleasure to be able to bring together my teaching at the university level with my work in the community. And the way that that's worked for the past five years um, since the Sa has been established is that wonderful college students there, many of them studying in my sociology classes, uh, will come into the community and do work and tutoring um, and activities with the young people that we're working with. And so we study different forms of literature, um, we do mythology, we've done Homer's works, and then we integrate that with the study of biblical stories and we kind of, all of that is integrated around studying different virtues. So love, courage, goodness, that kind of thing, through these stories and through song and through fun activities. And it's a blessing for the children in the program, but it's also a blessing for the college students who get a, you know, they get to kind of incarnate some of what they're studying about inequality. So rather than it just being something that they are encountering in their books, they can also be present and listen, listening to the young people and be a blessing in their lives as well. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Angel. I uh, appreciate you sharing that. Now I'll invite um, Chuck Roth uh, to tell us about his work in kind of through education, education facilitation. Uh, Chuck? Good morning. Thank you, Todd. Um, so my name is Chuck Roth. I'm the executive director for Boys Hope Girls Hope here in New Orleans. Um, we're an international organization um, with programs throughout the U.S. Um, and I run the New Orleans affiliate. Um, Boys Hope Girls Hope is an academic driven children's home. Uh, we were founded by the Jesuits um, initially in, as a, a boys a program serving young men uh, going to Jesuit high schools that needed a more stable home environment in order to really thrive at the school. Um, that expanded to Boys Hope Girls Hope, which um, in 1992, we began serving both boys and girls. Um, I've been with the organization about 19 years, uh, nine in Baltimore, 10 here in New Orleans. And um, the whole idea is to create a, create a really stable home environment uh, where we can 
not only provide the academic support, but also to help kids move through the developmental stages of their lives um, uh, with a faith component, uh, you know, immersed in all of that. And so um, we really uh, have two great homes that are very nurturing, but also uh, very supportive in, in all aspects of the kids' lives. And so, um, you know, I've had the great opportunity to work, uh, I would say more than 50 kids, uh, maybe more than that, um, and see them come from middle school through college graduation. And um, our support, while they, our kids live in one of our homes year round through high school, we also support them through college. And so um, to take a kid from say eight years old to see them graduate college is, is incredible. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, we know that education is, is uh, the trajectory that's gonna change a lot of kids and families' lives, um, so that is a, a you know a priority uh, in our mission. Um, but we also want these kids to become good husbands and fathers and mothers and wives, and uh, and also to be good community members. And so we really try to incorporate all those things um, into our program, so that when our kids graduate college and go into the professional world, that um, not only are they a, a positive impact to their their family but to the community that they live in okay excellent excellent um i'll just briefly talk about the the heart and mind community at the university of holy cross um heart and mind is in this is now the the uh the fifth year um uh that that heart and mind community has been active at the university of holy cross um, as the result of, a, a of the generous support of the Daughters of Charity, MMI, uh, as well as Raskob Family Foundation and, and some other partners, uh, we were able to create an intentional support community so that our first generation students, um, many of whom are from, um, uh, from, from minority communities, uh, so that they would never feel alone um, and so that they would receive support throughout um, their, their, their university career. You know, it certainly is one thing to accept students, you know, in as much as education can, can, can disrupt and stop a, a cycle of poverty. Um, it, it's one thing to accept students, but there's a, an additional responsibility and a particular responsibility, I think, as a Catholic university to be able to support and equip and, and help those students to be successful so that instead of simply continuing the, the cycle, they don't even worse not finish um, but then finish, you know, with, with considerable debt without a degree that allows them to break that cycle. So what we provide is um, every student gets uh, her own, his or her own mentor with whom she meets at least weekly, although most of our mentors are, are, are meeting in a very regular basis, um, especially during challenging moments with our, our mentees, our heart and mind students. Um, each one goes to counseling. Um, um, uh, and, and this is provided free of charge. Each has received um, a Franklin planner so that, so that dreams can actually be, be effectuated as goals. Um, uh, each one also is a part of the heart and mind uh, community, so we meet um, uh, monthly as well. Um, we also then provide a, an award so that we can offset um, uh, some of the time that our students are able to, to, to do the things that are necessary for first-gen students, such as the counseling, the tutoring, the, the time with mentors, etc., uh, instead of working for many of them a, a second, um, a second part-time job to be able to pay for incidentals for, for school. Um, when we began this work, uh, you know, we, we began with kind of the general structure that, that a number of different cohort models um, and, and support, uh, support groups begin with, you know, with basic tutoring, et cetera. But my, my first thought and the thought of our advisory committee is that as a Catholic university, we can certainly do more. Um, and so our research on the front end, we went into Holly Grove and uh, asked the community, you know, those that had been through um, uh, higher ed, uh, what helped, what didn't. We identified the key factors and, and we took it a step further to where we said, okay, well, what are the virtues that are most essential um, for first-gen students to, to, to be able to be, be uh, successful in university? We identified those first as the virtue of, of hope and second is the virtue of love in, especially in the dimension of Eros, which is a love that delights and accompanies the other. And we'll be able to talk about more of that in the, the section on, um, on, on love coming up. 
But the, the first question that I'll, I'll pose is, um, what is the role, you know, Angel, you're, the community with Neon Sa is a, a Christian classical um, uh, group and community. Obviously, there's, there's a, a certain inspiration. You have students, Chuck, you know, going to Catholic, you know, Catholic schools like Jesuit High School and, and, and others. But what is the role of faith lending toward, you know, this movement of grace in the work that you do? And I'll go ahead and, and, and just tee it up a little bit with some of the thoughts that I had. And you're right, Angel, when I started, it's almost like I needed a time to pause and just like I need a couple of hours just to think about what Deacon Larry said. You know, I just need a, a while to be able to do that. But, but in as much as we're going to be able to do that for phase two, when we'll have a full three hours with Deacon Larry, that's going to be on October 28th, and we'll talk about that later, uh, a few thoughts kind of, kind of struck me on, on the role of, of faith. One of which is that it, it, it gives us the means um, by, by focusing on Christ, by being receptive to the movement of grace in, 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 uh, in our hearts, to realize that, that love is bigger than all of the challenges and, and all of the problems that we face. So I think that certainly is, is one area to realize that even if we don't fully understand the way that, that, that love will navigate forward, um, the trust that we then have allows, allows us to work together and to realize that, that God's calculus is bigger than, than all of our failings. Uh, another one is, uh, and this is something that Deacon Larry really, really stressed, you know, he, he began, um, you know, with this conversion process by, by prostrating himself. And so I, I think that, that faith leads us, this trust leads us to realize that we are not doing this on our own, but instead that, that it, it gives us a sense of humility to where we, we can avoid maybe some of the big, some of the big um, pitfalls. Uh, one of the things that we discuss in the heart and mind community is the absolute need for authenticity. And by that, we mean avoiding a, a couple of, of temptations and a couple of, of challenges, one of which is the challenge that every one of us, uh, um, uh, I think, experiences, which is the tendency toward, instead of suffering through virtue, um, uh, virtue signaling. You know, and kind of that constant temptation to, to lend toward that as, as, as opposed to saying, okay, what is the authentic, what is the real need at this time? And, and the second is giving in to some of the resentment that, 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 you know, Deacon Larry talked about as well. Another element that I, I think faith inspires is that it, it leads us toward a love um, uh, and toward change, which requires that we go back. Deacon Larry said that he, you know, he went back to his family, he went back to his dad, you know, he's now active in the community, he's a, a, certainly a tangible witness. Um, I think sometimes what we need to see is we need to see personal change, but then realize that that means we necessarily have to go back um, uh, to those that God has given us so that we can, we can share that with others. Um, uh, Angel, I'll, I'll invite you to talk about the role of faith in the work that, that you do with the Ansah. Sure. Yeah, I think um, from Deacon Larry's testimony, what's so important from the beginning is the first outpouring of grace that he talked about was the woman who came to his house and brought the family food on Thanksgiving, right? Um, that it was just a tremendous grace. It wasn't something he expected. It wasn't within his experience of the white community. And it was really a breaking in and impouring of God's grace that just got his attention. So when I think about that in terms of the work that we do, when I think about who Christ is and how Christ came to us physically, um, that that physical presence is so very important. Um, for those who are dealing with suffering and oppression, um, it is not enough to just have a kind of abstract, abstract presentation um, of, you know, scripture or the gospel, that's part of it. Uh, but you really do need that presence, that, um, that work of presence in the Christian faith, um, being the hands and feet of Christ to those who are suffering. And so for that reason, just being present with each other, being present with those who are struggling under difficult circumstances, I think is incredibly important. Um, from there, though, once we have the kids with us, uh, part of what we are doing, as I said, we, we do study different kinds of literature and stories, but we also center our study of the Bible. All right, right. So um, 
in the black community, traditionally, faith and Christian faith has been very central. Um, very central in organizing our struggles, in giving us hope to overcome um, almost inconceivable challenges. Today, however, more and more, um, what we're seeing is that that's not always the case. Um, that Christian faith is not as deeply rooted. It's not something that we can take for granted all the time. And so when the kids are in their different groups, um, you know, I will circulate and go around to the different rooms. And when I come to the Bible room, I am continually surprised by what kind of basic stories the kids have not been exposed to before. You know, that again, we cannot take for granted an understanding of the Christian faith and so some of, you know, just that basic, who is God? Who is Christ? Why were you created? And there was a, one of the movements uh, or one of the outpourings of God's grace that Deacon Larry talked about was someone telling him specifically, it was, let's see, this was his third movement of grace. So his third movement of grace, it was Sue Gorman who told him specifically, um, God loves you, Larry. Right? So even being able to hear that very clearly through the presence of people who are caring for you, um, through the scriptures, learning who God is, why you were created, um, that Christ was sent for you, all of that's incredibly important as well to dealing with a key aspect of Deacon Larry's story um, was his movement from resentment and hatred to a place of faith. So when you are, you know, living under conditions that are debilitating, um, if you're living and struggling with material poverty, um, you know, all sorts of other kinds of challenges, it is very easy to become resentful and to be filled with hatred, right? So I think having that, you know, those, those twin pillars of the physical presence of those who are the hands and feet of Christ together with learning the promises of God and how God has been faithful through generations, through generations going back um, to the people of Israel, and then even, especially in our context, working mainly with African-American students, God's faithfulness to black people as well, and that God is there for you today. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Angel. Um, Chuck, the, the same question. What is, what is the role of faith in, in the work that, that you do? Um, you know, just, yeah, I, I, I took the liberty to listen to uh, Deacon Olney, uh, some of his talks yesterday, and I've read some of his, his uh, information in the past. And so, um, you know, when I, this was presented, you know, faith to me, there's on mine, I have a, a sign in my my house it says faith equals trust you know and um and that, that was really just um it, it's really what we try to accomplish here in our in our two homes is that you know if we're going to be productive and we're going to be effective with the children in our care um trust is a critical um foundation um to getting work done and and that comes you know with faith and we have kids that come that have a history of faith and we have kids that come to us that have no history of faith or, or religious worship in their lives and so you know it's taking those steps to establish um initially a, a, a trust in and the people that are, that are providing care for them and then to move into um the bigger part so we we become part of a church community we become active in the community through community service and so all these small pieces of of expressions of faith and trust and uh giving back to the community for a lot of our kids um you know it's, it's fascinating to go to a homeless shelter for many of them who have been in that situation and to have to go to a soup kitchen um is their favorite thing to do because it's something that they uh resonate with and they go back and they're able to then impact people who've been in similar situations to them. And so, and then, you know, obviously being able to tie that into a reflection and conversation with the kids on how we can even be more impactful um, in our works. And, um, 
And, you know, one of the things listening to Deacon Olney um, is I have to remember to be more consistent with my words, you know, that, that God does love you. And, um, and we, I probably don't say that enough to the kids. I try to show it through my actions and I try, which I think is important too. Um, but his, his talk was a, a great reminder that, um, uh, that, um, you know, someone, uh, the, the Sue Gorman coming up and just saying those simple words was transformational. And, uh, and so, um, it's a great reminder that all of the works that we do um, also need to be supported sometimes by just some simple words. Um, and so a um, couple of things that I, that I came out of that um, is, uh, you know, I, I think that the other piece about um, the woman bringing Thanksgiving dinner um, you know, one thing we really try to be mindful of is that in our work to help other people that we're not taking away their dignity and for them to experience it in a way that is of love and, and that it's, um, but it's not looking down on them because I have food and they don't have food, therefore I'm this, you know, mighty helpful person. You know, it's about really trying to be mindful of, you know, their dignity while also um, trying to help them in whatever way we can. And, um, and that's, that's also with our own kids because some of our families are really struggling. We try to help them as much as we can, but you know, it can often get blurred and grayed with um, a hierarchical, you know, relationship and, and, and that becomes unproductive in time. You know, it, it, initially it might not be that harmful, um, but in time it is harmful. And, um, and it becomes resentful and it breaks down that trust. And, and it's the whole thing we're working to accomplish. And so, um, you know, I, it, yeah, lots of thoughts coming through that. Um, but I know um, it's, it's interesting, I guess, to look also at our college kids. And I use a young lady, Daniela, um, who came to our home and went to Dominican high school and was not Catholic and was very challenged by many of the Catholic teachings because they conflicted sometimes with her belief system. Um, but as she finished college, um, recognized that going to Dominican was one of the best things, best decisions she, that happened for her because it really, while she didn't always, she didn't grow up Catholic and she didn't necessarily have the exact beliefs, what going to a Catholic church, a school did was really challenge her to say, well, what are my beliefs? You know, if you're never challenged in your beliefs, then you never really develop them and mature, you know, really take on ownership in what my beliefs are. And so, um, so you know, faith is critical. Um, we all know that we're going to hit stages in life where there's not much else going to get us through it but faith, <laughs> you know. And, and that's, and our kids have already experienced that. So that's really why I try to use that as an example that they've already been through so many tough times. That let's see why they, how they got through them, why they got through them, and how do we apply that to the rest of their life. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Chuck. Um, yeah, I think I think a, a, a couple of things that both of you have, have touched on that I, I think would be key in looking at the ways that within the area at which we are, um, we can we can do meaningful um, meaningful work. When, when I was speaking with, with Deacon Larry on the, the front end of this healing action initiative, and as we were putting it together and thinking, what is the, the best way as, as, you know, from within the Catholic tradition as well as, as in the area of education, that, that we, can, we can really develop a, an initiative to be able to help others to move forward as well as ourselves. We, we both noted that, um, you know, people keep going to Deacon Larry and saying, hey, what can I do? What can I do? And as we were discussing, the, the answer that, that, that we came up with is the response has to be, well, tell me where you are, right? What, where, where are you? What are your opportunities to be able to then love and serve others? Um, and as, as educators and education facilitators as well, we have a, a unique role to be able to participate in what has been one of the most civilizing and, and dignity affirming and building enterprises that there is, especially a, a, a liberating, a liberal arts education that affirms 
um, the goodness of the human person, but, but also we see tracked in there, especially as informed by the Christian faith, that there's a brokenness there. You know, so, so this invitation to love, an invitation that Deacon Larry and, and you mentioned and, and uh, Angel as well as you, Chuck, has to take on a physical, a tangible expression. Um, I, I wonder if any of the seven, because I'm, I'm tracking them as Deacon Larry is talking about these seven movements of grace. I, I wonder if any of them would have happened, but for the one in front. I think sometimes, and, and I think we're seeing this at the University of Holy Cross, um, uh, Blessed Basil Moreau said, we, we will never educate the mind at the expense of the heart. And I, I, think, I think a lot of times we think in terms of intellectual content, and that's essential, um, but often what has to precede that is a, a simple, tangible, um, uh, disaffected um, act of kindness that, that in, sparks a query of why would you do this? Um, and, and the answer is, because somebody loved me first. Because somebody loved me first. And I think faith is the invitation and this movement of faith where, you know, you, you mentioned, Chuck, of course, faith is, is trust. It's, it's trust in God, but it's a, it's a trust that doesn't suspend understanding, but instead continues to seek and to look for that understanding. Um, this is going to give us, a, I think, a good trajectory going forward. If you've now brought these, these recorded um, talks and this discussion to your, your parish, to your school, to your, your community, um, uh, then you will now continue this conversation. But I'd, I'd like to give maybe one other thought that we can kind of kind of go through a little bit. We had a listening session at the University of Holy Cross, and, and there were some, some really, really helpful anecdotes and, and racial experiences. And some of them, I think, will, be, will, will resonate also with our, our um, speaker, Father Josh Johnson, at the end. But I think one of the things that we can do, inspired by faith, inspired by you know, Deacon Larry talked about some of the social doctrine of the church, a Christian understanding of the human person. Um, but is that, that what we can do is we can say, well, well, what is the stereotype? And can education help us to blow that up? Give me the stereotype and we'll blow it up. Because there are a lot of other approaches. There are consent decrees. There are different political, economic, and social means by which to address the challenges that we're seeing. But I, I think as educators in particular, one of the anecdotes that that um uh that was shared was was one of our african american students who 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 discussed being stopped and that when the um uh, police officer saw his student id his university of holy cross student id he said their whole demeanor changed it was this as if they you know it is as if they 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 looked at him very differently as a result of that and of course i'm, I'm sure that was very trying and to be you know to be uh judged based on an accidental quality such as whether I'm a college student or not, is, is not worthy of, of full human respect. And yet, I think there's something to the fact that, that seeing that ID blew up people's preconceptions. I had a, a, a friend, he was, he was on um, uh, one of the, the special operations teams um, in, our, in our company. Um, he was African-American, uh, was, was um, uh, from Mississippi, and he used to carry his DD-214, his personnel file, um, because he, he said people won't just look at him and think this is a special operator, this is a, you know, a non-commissioned officer, this is somebody getting a, you know, a, a graduate degree in Latin American studies. And so he used to carry that. I think there's a role there. Uh, I think maybe it's, it's unfortunate. But I, I wonder if part of our role is to blow up these preconceptions and if the movement of faith can give us the inspiration, the challenge, and the ability to recognize the dignity and value of those around us. So um, at this point, we will, uh, we will pause. Um, it's 10.05. Um, we'll begin again at, uh, let's say, 10.10. Just take a five-minute break. Um, uh, with Dr. Mario Sacasa, who will help us to, to focus on, on this lens of Catholic identity, on the virtue of hope. And uh, then we'll look at how hope is essential to the work that we do and an essential part of Christian education. Thank you very much. We'll see you in five minutes. <laughs>